Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. In this series, we dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join me in real time by sending me your comments or questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at the point with LX at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. Uh, we live stream Headline Buster at 11 a.m. Beijing time, usually on Thursdays, and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Fridays. So do join me during the live streaming and get in touch. We would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments or questions as well. So, blocks or bricks? As emerging economies gather for another BRICS summit, the global landscape has changed vastly. With emerging economies being a powerful engine for global growth, can BRICS help facilitate a fairer world order, especially as US-dominated G7 and NATO are to hold their summits later this month? Chinese President Xi Jinping offered his answers to questions of the times during a keynote speech at the opening ceremony of the BRICS Business Forum, which opened on Wednesday. Sometimes smooth, sometimes rough, but always moving forward. Although the international situation is constantly changing, the trend of open development will not. The desire to work together to face challenges will not change. With the 14th BRIC summit opening this week, it's a good time to look at the history of this institution. Now, when the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the United States became the only superpower. In 1992, American GDP in purchasing power parity firms was one-fifth of the global total, the largest among all countries. Now, the newly formed Russian Federation took up some 3% and China was slightly higher, but accounting for only some 5%. It was clearly a unipolar world, as you can see. Now, things have been changing. Most noticeably, the United States and China have been following diverging trends, and I'll explain. By the way, the columns you see in front of me in this 3D map, a virtual map actually, are actually measured against each country's relative importance to the world's economy using GDP numbers in PPP terms from the World Bank. So GDP comparisons using PPP are arguably more useful than those using nominal GDP when assessing the domestic market of the state. That's why we're using this here. Now, it's an approximation, but hopefully it gives you an idea of how things evolved over time. Fast forward to the 21st century. The financial crisis in 2008 was a crucial turning point for the United States. As you can see, its importance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the global economy started to drop steadily ever since. But China's jumped and India and Brazil, as you can see, also saw their share growing despite the crisis. Against this backdrop, the BRICS leaders held their first official meeting in 2009. China hosted the BRICS summit for the first time in 2011 in the southern Chinese city of Sanya, when the world was still reeling from the impact of the financial crisis. It was also the first time after South Africa joined the meeting. And by the way, you see it here in South Africa. By then, the five countries accounted for some 27% of global GDP and 40% of the global population. That's not a small number. A second time that China hosted the BRICS summit was in 2017 in the southern Chinese city of Xiamen. That's also around the time when the Chinese GDP in PPP terms overtook that of the United States, as you will see in the comparison of these columns. Now, what happened to the collective weight of BRICS countries? It went further up to almost 29%. Meanwhile, the share of the U.S. economy continued to decline to some 16% of the world's total. It was in that summit that China first proposed BRICS Plus to invite leaders of five more developing countries to the summit. 
Now, despite COVID-19 and the global economic challenge, the overall weight of the five countries has kept rising. By 2020, the five countries accounted for some over 30 percent of global GDP. And now we have come to the year 2022, when the summit is being hosted by China again. And the theme this time is foster high quality BRICS partnership, ushering a new era for global development. And despite the pandemic, some 2,600 people are expected to participate in the various meetings that are going on. The enthusiasm is obvious. By the way, the background behind me is the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. I think it's important for all emerging and developing economies. Uh, I think many forums uh, have been dominated by um, you know, the big economic powers who have been calling the shots on global matters for a long, long time. Uh, the emergence of the grouping of BRICS, uh, where there are large economies that are emerging economies, I think can understand issues and challenges faced by other emerging and developing economies better. Thailand is one of the countries that's been invited to participate under the BRICS Plus mechanism. And according to the International Monetary Fund, BRICS countries have contributed half of the world economic growth since the group's inception, and it continues to lead global economic recovery. Now, how much do you know about this group? How is it likely to change things for you in the future? As usual, let's take a look, let's take a look at how the international media have been covering BRICS for you. The answer is very short. They don't. Actually, the international media seem to have been avoiding this subject all along. What do I mean? I mean, I googled BRICS together with the name of any major Western media outlet, and uh, I could feel that I was almost traveling back in time in a time machine. For instance, a few days before the meetings convened, I tried searching CNN with BRICS, and the top three results were from the years 2013 and 2012. How about searching the BBC's reports on BRICS? The top result was from 2012 as well. And the next two reports were four and 10 years old, respectively. How about the Washington Post? Well, the top search result was from six years ago. And if you take a look at the title of that report, it would actually make you giggle now that we look at it from this historical perspective, the rise and fall of BRICS. It seems some people just like to play profit, right? The end of history, as you can recall by the famous Western political theorist. The Great Fall of China, that's the title of a piece on, uh, in 2015 on the state of the Chinese economy the rise and fall of the BRICS this time. So who would have known that history doesn't end? China has been there for thousands of years and BRICS has not only survived, but also is thriving. Now, the title of uh, this 2014 story about what's known as the BRICS Bank seems to show some interest in the group. But actually, the first thing in the article tells you the opposite. At least the author is not shy about giving that impression. He says he did the story because an old buddy needed help with the research, not because the topic is important or interesting. Hmm, lots of enthusiasm. So besides these specific media, what happens if I search for news about BRICS in general? You know what? You will have the impression that you're on the Chinese regional net because the results are almost exclusively from Chinese media. Clearly, there is a lack of interest from the West in this group, which covers some 30% of global GDP and counting. Among the few serious reports I can find in the international media, I actually quickly discovered some kind of pattern. What do I mean? Let's take a look at this U US newspaper, for, uh, for instance. Nothing against this paper in person, personally, but its reporting on the subject is so bizarre that I can't help talking about it again. Now, breaking from its apparent historical apathy for BRICS, this newspaper actually published two articles within days in March. The first one reads, outside the West, Putin is less isolated than you might think. And the other one, 
Russia's allies have been pretty quiet on Ukraine, of course, when it means Russian's allies, it means its BRIC counterparts. And you don't even have to open the articles to understand why it's against the backdrop of Russia's military operations in Ukraine. The idea basically is to say that after Russia launched the war, its counterparts from the BRICS group were accomplices to Putin by not following the West and denouncing this evil act of invasion. Does that help you understand the real purpose of this group? Not as a platform for 40% of humanity, but as a group of morally dubious countries with some kind of hidden and nefarious agenda? And the second article got some basic facts wrong too. The countries in BRICS are not allies to each other or allies of Russia. They have formed this group because of their collective economic position and interest, and they form their opinion on international on international topics based on the merits of the issue and their long-standing foreign policy and their legitimate national interests. Turning to the BRICS summit that's being hosted this week in Beijing, it's radio silence again, pretty much, on the Western media. What did I say? The historical apathy for this subject seems to rule again. In an unprecedented manner, though, a Japanese media has picked up the story. Matter of fact reporting taken from Reuters, nothing wrong, nothing unusual. China calls for expanding BRICS block of emerging economies. But what about this photo that this article used to highlight the idea? Does it look weird to you? It sure does to me. Now, BRICS is about a group of countries discussing matters important to emerging economies. It's not about any one or two countries dominating the dialogue or agenda. So why are only senior officials from China and Russia singled out? What does the picture want to imply? That, they are, that the Chinese and Russian officials are trying to contrive some kind of a dark scheme for the world? That uh, the other members do not matter? Maybe I should ask the photo editors, for an explanation. But given the kind of China threat rhetoric touted by the Japanese government and some in the Japanese media, we don't need to try very hard to understand the messaging. Nice try, but no, it's just not truthful. So time to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about why the Western mainstream media have been quiet on BRICS. Has BRICS Plus come as a surprise? And has BRICS not only, how has BRICS not only survived, but is also growing and why more countries may be interested to join. Stay with me. Welcome back to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined by Ren Ling, Head of Global Governance Division of the Institute of World Economics and Politics and the Senior F uh, Research Fellow of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. We have Dr. Swaran Singh, a visiting professor with the University of British Columbia, joining us from Vancouver, Canada, and uh, Alice uh, Alessandro Teixeira, Distinguished Professor from the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University, joining us from Beijing. The warmest welcome to all of you to Headline Buster. Uh, first of all, I want to go to my guests to help, to help us understand why the apathy, the apparent apathy, I don't know whether you noticed that, but uh, I clearly had difficulties finding relevant uh, news reports from mainstream Western media on the subject in the days leading up to this very latest summit. Um, Professor Teixeira, let me go to you first. Uh, basically, uh, I, I, I had the joy to be in the Brazilian government when we set up and we start discussing uh, the BRICS. Uh, 16 years ago, and uh, the Western media in general, to be more directly, United States and allied, they are very skeptical about in having China, India, Brazil, and Russia, and then South Africa together. Uh, because, of course, uh, this is a great voice. The idea of setting up BRICS was to give a broader voice, a strong voice, not for only these countries, but for developing countries. And, and that was a big element of uh, uh, setting up. So. So when President Xi Jinping talking about BRICS Plus uh, was our idea since the beginning was to create uh, a mechanism, a cooperation mechanism that could empower developing countries in an agenda, not only economic agenda, but a social agenda. And of course, that threats not only United States, but Europe, because when we go to G7, we go to G20, they are very alike in terms of their agenda for developed countries. 
Professor Singh, your take, your observation. I know the Indian media, by the way, in my uh, preparation work for this episode, I noticed there's quite some interest, quite some discussion on this topic through the Indian media. So how do you look at the contrast of uh, interest? You know, in the Western countries, they seem to don't, just don't find it interesting, whereas in India, there's actually quite a lot of discussion on this, on this topic. Thank you, Lucian. Uh, I think, first of all, any major international initiative uh, where China is on the lead uh, is uh, looked upon in the West with a certain amount of suspicion or skepticism. And there is no doubt that one after another strategy reports and documents from the United States have said that China is the challenge, that China is trying to replace the United States-led world order or its leadership, at least in the Indo-Pacific region, etc. So uh, the, the kind of uh, anxiety to a certain extent that uh, initiatives led by China would create uh, would mean that they would have caution in sort of uh, even making an objective uh, assessment of uh, BRICS. Uh, second, I think very clearly uh, the focus of West right now is on uh, Ukraine and on Russia. And this is going to be this year's first multilateral uh, meeting of such important national leaders uh, where President Putin is joining. So that makes them all the more kind of uh, you know, anxiety prone. Uh, will it be that, uh, you know, not just BRICS nations, but this is going to be extended meeting with the leaders outreach. Some other national leaders are likely to also you know, join BRICS uh, in terms of special invitees. So there are uh, concerns that West has and therefore wants to kind of uh, black out you know, on uh, what BRICS is doing and not showcase that it has a certain traction, certain leverages that can influence global decision making. And finally, of course, the pandemic, the whole chaos in, in economic growth rates, healthcare in several of the Western countries, again, is something that they would not like to sort of uh, shift the focus to something else where certain countries have been relatively better in terms of managing their health crisis, economic crisis. Yeah. Um, Professor Teixeira, what we also understood, not, not, not only that BRICS has survived, uh, but it's also expanding. As I said, in 2017, uh, the water was tested when five developing countries were invited as special guests, let's say, to the table. And now it seems that the, uh, the, um, the idea is much more formal and we have nine more countries, developing countries from all over the world, uh, potentially on board as well, either in official or inofficial capacity. Capacity. How do you look at the kind of vitality that's driving the BRICS forward and attracting more countries, more developing countries, to join this group? I, I think, uh, Liu Xing, we enter in the second phase of BRICS right now. Okay, when we we start BRICS, we plan that BRICS will not have a formal institutionalization, meaning we will not have a secretariat a committee uh, that would be uh, going around different countries. Uh, and then we, are, we, we saw that uh, in the future, we could not only create one institution that was NEDB, that we had a debate if we call BRICS Bank NEDB, but we, we, we decided to call the New Developed Bank. Mm -hmm. And you were expecting that this institution would support uh, the BRICS countries' development at first. Second phase is why? Because now it's time to enlarge. Many Western media, especially again United States and European Union, they try to bet against BRICS, saying that BRICS would uh, be born but would be dying very soon uh, because changes in political areas in, in India, South Africa, China. And this didn't happen. What we see is that although we do need a reform uh, or international organization, it's very clear that BRICS will expand. We have candidacy for Latin America. We have candidacy from uh, Middle East. Yes. We have candidacy for uh, Africa countries. So things are expanding. We already let in the NEDB new new members. For example, Egypt is a new member. Right. Uh, UAE is a new member. So in this second phase, I think it's very important for the future of BRICS as a multilateral and a, a, a cooperation mechanism. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ren, there are some misconceptions to be corrected here as I was looking at the headlines of some reports on the BRICS. For instance, they think that this is uh, a, 
an alliance of with China in the middle, right? China is trying to dominate the agenda or dictate things as some other kind of military alliance that we see in the West. And uh, that there is some kind of, you know, secret hidden agenda that's on the mind of China or on some members, for instance, China and Russia, as if they're trying to find shelter or trying to find support for their nefarious conduct in the world. Uh, exactly what is BRICS trying to achieve? What's the structure of BRICS and how do members uh, decide or cooperate to push forward the matters that are important to their development? Thank you, Liu Xin, for the question. Actually, I would say, let the fact speak. Make an example to answer this question. For example, we have the BRICS New Development Bank at the very beginning, actually for the other international organizations, they designed the structure and the voting quota according to the member country's GDP co uh, value. But actually for us, the new uh, BRICS New Development Bank actually distribute according to the principle of equal contribution to the origin of uh, capital, as well as gave equal discourse to all the members. Uh, secondly, they also for the BRICS New Development Bank, it is not actually um, like the Western media have said. It is actually driven by the market market forces, which is based, which means it ba it operates based on the market principle as well. So, according to this fact, actually, you could say it is a good trial for this kind of uh, structure governance structure of which is aimed at, you know, the democratization for the international relations. So this is the fact to answer this question. Mm. Thank you. How are things discussed? How are things decided among the BRICS? Uh, is it, you know, a lot of discussion? Uh, one of the other suspicion or, or criticism is that, you know, you talk, 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 there's not much coming out, but actually there are a lot of things going on. I understand there are a lot of projects, a lot of collaboration going on all different levels. Um, so how exactly is BRICS functioning? Yeah, actually BRICS is not like one dimensional mechanism. It has three driving forces with the Troika, like politics, economics, and you know, people and culture communication. And actually many many outcomes could be saved in all those bills for example to uh, promote the the uh, the reform of global governance actually also to uh, we set up a BRICS innovation base and we have the university union and we have done a lot in the uh, you know, global health governance. Actually, a lot of outcomes could be witnessed in the past few years. Mm. So therefore, I would argue that we should look into the real content, the real efforts that BRICS have made so that we could have a better and a correct understanding of it. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Singh, let's come back to India once again, because India is a very important member of BRICS. But as you said, India's participation is very much sought after by Western countries, by the United States, for instance, in its latest um, you know, project to set up an economic framework for the so-called Indo-Pacific. And uh, so how do you look at the position of India? And why is India attaching so much importance to the BRICS as well, despite the differences it has, you know, with some members, uh, for instance, China on, so for instance, border issues. India's foreign policy, uh, Liushin, as you know, was anchored around the principle of non-alignment for a long period of time. And that had its linkages to the Cold War, where two blocks were the military alliances that India was trying to avoid. At end of Cold War, India has changed its policy now, which is positive and proactive and calls it multi-alignments, which means India's foreign policy today seeks to build partnerships in as many sectors in, with as many countries as possible. Mm -hmm. and so that explains uh, why India is uh, able to be in uh, Western forums as well as forums that bring Russia and China and India together, like the BRICS. Uh, so India chooses to be 
very specific on where it can really benefit, where it can contribute. And that explains that uh, right now the focus in post-pandemic world is very clearly on resilience of economy, uh, economic resilience, healthcare, and that is something which brings India closer to BRICS. Other than there are issues, as uh, Dr. Ran just mentioned, uh, areas uh, like climate change, terrorism, security, development, and so many other areas. But right now the focus is on economic resilience. And during the pandemic, China was an unusual economy to growth, uh, despite the fact that several other, including most Western countries, that saw neg negative growth. Right. India today is fastly fast growing economy. So I think right now to you know tell it in very short, uh, it's economic interest primarily of post-pandemic resilience, okay. which is where I think India's connectivity to BRICS okay. and improving inter BRICS trade is very important. All right. Professor uh, Teixeira, for one quick last question, it is estimated that uh, the BRICS will account for about 50% of global GDP by 2030. Do you see that trend being disrupted by obstacles such as the pandemic and possible other economic uncertainties? Why is it important to pay attention to BRICS? Uh, no, I don't see this as being put back, uh, especially because I believe in the next few years we're going to enlarge BRICS. So BRICS is going to have more and more importance in terms of economic growth. But it's important this meeting, especially this meeting, because we're going to discuss how BRICS can help not itself, but also other members okay. and outside the world to recover from COVID-19 economy. All right. We have to leave it there. Time being very limited. Many thanks to Reneng from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Swaran Singh from the University of British Columbia, and Alessandro Teixeira from Tsinghua University. Thank you so much for your insights. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of uh, Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. Until next time, on behalf of the whole team, thanks for watching, and you've got The Point.